Awesome. Thank you. I like the way they put all the buttons. So, yeah, obviously I know technology. I'm qualified to speak here. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, uh, I'm going to talk a lot today. I'll try to talk slowly. When I talk about things that I'm interested in, I tend to talk, start talking really fast. So if I do that, tell me to slow down. It's okay. Um, I also had a lot of caffeine today, too, so I had an early flight, so I'll try to not be too crazy. So we're going to talk a little bit about copyright in the technology landscape. Um, I'm going to start out talking a little bit about who we are. I'm kind of one of, the, one of the case studies here to talk about some things that we've done as an organization that I hope uh, will, will help maybe uh, inspire you, uh, to, uh, you know, give you a couple ideas of things you can be thinking about. And, and I'm going to step out of the traditional publishing role because I know we're all here for the sure. But I'm going to tell you, content goes way beyond just your publishing branch. And you know, one of the things that you, we really need to start thinking about it as organizations is leveraging all the content we have, not just the stuff in our journals and not just the stuff in our books, um, which I realize is, is the, the area that many of you all have responsibility for. But uh, I'm going to urge you to get back to your organizations and talk about other things. Um, talk a little bit about those content types some delivery channels, new revenue opportunities. Obviously, a lot of you are probably here because you're, you're wanting to think about how you can generate revenue from your content, your intellectual property. And believe me, that's a really important thing when we see the landscape of advertising and all those things. And a little bit about what's next. So who we are, the College of Chess Physicians, um, our mission and vision, you know, we're basically a clinical organization. We're, we're geared toward physicians who treat diseases of the chest. Um, there's no such thing as a chest physician. So we have pulmonary, critical care, sleep medicine, thoracic surgeons, pediatricians. We kind of have a big conglomeration of people uh, that we cater to. And, you know, we want to be the leader in, in providing them with education. So, you know, we're our largest clinical pulmonary, critical care, and sleep society. We've got 18,000 members plus in over 100 countries, uh, mostly physicians, but we also have RTs, nurses, uh, PhDs, PharmDs, um, and really we're focused on medical education, obviously. We publish CHEST, and we've really tried to leverage that, that brand of CHEST, because that's what people tend to know on everything we do. So our annual meeting is called the CHEST meeting, and we have CHEST Challenge, which is like a, a Jeopardy quiz show for fellows in training. We have a CHEST physician newspaper, so we really try, try to think about that brand of our journal and how we can leverage that to all the other educational opportunities that we do, and, and you know, how that ties into you know, protecting and building intellectual property property based on your brand. We do a lot of continuing medical education. We do an annual meeting. We have board courses for fellows in training. We do simulation, which I'll get to in a minute, uh, online things. We do mock board exams. We have ebooks. We have iPhone apps, um, CDs, and then we also produce guidelines. So my point here is we have a lot of content across a lot of functional areas of our organization. They're not just, it's not just about publishing books and, and journals and all that stuff like you. Here's, our, here's a, a, a look at our simulation uh, lab. We have these high fidelity mannequins that we're beginning to teach people how to do things um, like procedures where they can practice on a mannequin and not you when you're sick in the hospital. Uh, believe me, that's a bonus. Um, and, and they do everything. I mean, they bleed, they, they, they ooze things. They have uh, the, the picture on the, the right uh, of the mannequin's head. They have eyes that are photosensitive. The pupils dilate and things like that. Uh, they react to medical scenarios just like a person would. Um, they have teeth that break away. If you're trying to intubate them and you're being too rough, their teeth will break just like a real person's would. Uh, we do these type of things. And, and this is the kind of, I mean, this is a future of where education is going. <clears throat> it's not just about printing things and publishing things online. It's about interactive and, and starting to think about how do you get control of that intellectual property and, and, and think about how can you monetize it beyond just having a publication people buy or a course that they attend. I think that's where uh, we can start to think about integrating uh, the ability to manage rights and permissions and, and leverage this content into audiences and potential customers around the world. So chest is our big dog, right? Everybody knows chest. That's kind of, we did all these surveys and no, nobody knows who the American College of Chest Physicians is. That's, you know, our annual meeting used to be called the Annual International Scientific Assembly of the American College of Chest Physicians. <laughs> You can't possibly remember that. You know, you can't even write it without making a typo. Uh, so, you know, we renamed it the Chest Meeting. It's easy to remember. It leverages our brand. It's, you know, people know it. Um, so, it's got, you know, print circulation 16,000, but we get over 400,000 visitors to our website every month. Um, we have a mobile app that's pushing 40,000 downloads. Um, the impact factor is good. Lots of citations. And we do international editions all over the world. Again, leveraging that brand and trying to get uh, the publication out beyond our, our typical audience. 
Um, these are uh, a look at the apps that we've done actually with Shanae's group and Feto Mobile. Um, we have an iPad and an iPhone based app. Um, and, you know, for an organization that has 18,000 members, the fact that we've had nearly 40,000 downloads of the app is, is you know, we're, we're psyched about that. Um, and we see that as a way, you know, medicine's going mo mobile. There's no doubt about it. I mean, everything's going mobile, but physicians especially are huge, heavy users of mobile technology. So as we started thinking about how we're leveraging content and what we're doing with rights and permissions, we want to make sure that as they transition to using apps and iPads and things like that, we need to be able to, to get something, we need to capture that interest and make sure that we're able to monetize our permissions revenue and our, and our intellectual property revenue um, when they're using those devices, not just on the web or looking at our print products. So this is kind of a snapshot of some of the different content types we have. You know, the journal is print, online, mobile app. We've got video, podcasts, um, all that kind of stuff. We have a tabloid newspaper that's uh, in print and, and is in development with an online edition. We have a, a board of view, a product that's a print and an app based product, ebooks, um, online only uh, education for CME. We've got guidelines and consensus statements that are also part of that website and app. Uh, we're doing patient education, uh, course handouts and slide decks, and, and now we're starting to do simulation education where we're trying to videotape those, those scenarios where the doctors are doing those simulation exercises so people can watch how they react when, that, when your patient starts going downhill, what do they do? Um, having that video captured so that we can show them after the fact, here's how you did, or other people can look at how certain teams react in a clinical scenario. That's really valuable educationally, so we're trying to capture all that in video, but we want to make sure that we find ways to a, monetize it and, and protect it because that's our, that's our intellectual property. So this is a... This is our journal revenue. I call it a portfolio because let's face it, any, any, any smart financial strategy, you're going to have a diversified portfolio, right? So we've got subscriptions, which is, you know, is the big dog, print advertising, which used to be the big dog, but isn't quite as big as it used to be anymore, uh, reprints, and then licensing and permissions is about 7% of our revenue. Um, and that's been growing steadily over the last several years because of the things that I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, you know, it's well into the six figure range and, you know, that's, that's nothing to sneeze at obviously that, that that's a, a big revenue source that we're trying to actively grow and I think you as you're thinking about what you're doing with all of your content and how you manage it you know this is a piece of the portfolio that I think can become a, a much bigger piece of the pie uh, going forward so you know permit you know, how we turn intellectual property into dollars, you know, obviously there's permission fees for reproducing figures, tables, other data, uh, reuse of content for course packs, um, you know, now digitally and online LMS platforms, a lot of that stuff is out there, uh, translations and, and all kinds of rights. And as many of you might know, managing those rights can be pretty labor intensive. Um, I know Copyright Clearance Center is sponsoring this, this session, or not sponsor, they organize this session. I'm not here to pimp the CCC. I'm here to talk to you about what we did that's been successful um, because you know, we're looking at ways that we can boost the revenue and, and protect our property. We found that to be, you know, I oversee about 20, now I guess 27 staff. I really want them to spend time doing things that are, is going to generate more content. And I found that working with a partner who manages some of your rights and permissions and helps you monetize it, it definitely is labor, uh, it saves you labor of your staff. You know, basically, um, by integrating their, one of their products, this online rights link system, which allows you to kind of custom build logic trees of different types of uses and set up automatic pricing scenarios, it saved our staff a huge amount of time. And, and to me, that's really valuable, and that's that, uh, that's what I'm here to tell you about is is that it's a nice way to to save some of the some of the labor and generate revenue for you. Uh, uh, Steve, about copyright yeah. clearance center. Yeah, you can just keep going. Yeah, yeah, no, no, <laughs> no this is only the slide. I swear. Um, no, so uh, you know, and, and the other thing is that certain types of requests, obviously, we don't want to have be part of an automated system. They'll still come to us. And, you know, we manage you know certain scenarios ourselves and everything. But we found this to be uh, a nice way to manage um, the process, save time, and, and generate revenue. So. 
you know, one of the things that you need to think about is, you know, the more content you have online and, and in places where people can easily find it, the more opportunities you're going to have to make money from that content. Um, we put our whole archive online back to 1935, and we made everything that was older than one year free to everybody. We didn't charge for the archive. We made it free to view. And, and I'll tell you what, we got loads of traffic from that. We have, you know, librarians email us all the time saying, thank you for not charging for this. This is really wonderful. We get tons of uses, usage. It drives a lot of traffic to our website. And and guess what? We frequently get requests to use older content that probably nobody would have found because it's often a print archive somewhere. And if they weren't at the library looking through it, they never would have found it. But because they did an online search and stuff came up and they can find an image that they liked, next thing you know, they're contacting us saying, oh, I want to use this figure. Um, and and you know, we end up getting uh, royalty fees for that. Um, you know, so we get over 5 million visitors to, the, to our journal site every year. We only have 18,000 members. That's a huge opportunity, right? So we have to find ways to try to leverage that opportunity and turn it into revenue. And that's what we're trying to do. So the way we've, we've done that is, you know, basically for our table of contents, every single article we have a reprint and permission link. So if somebody is right on the website, you know, we're trying to capture that permissions at the point of contact. Because if, if you're like most of us, for a long time we had a little button way over on the left or the right hand side of the navigation that kind of said reprints and permissions. And of course, how many people do you think actually go and look at that? Nobody, right? Everybody thinks that, you know, I mean, I talk to our doctors all the time. They think that if it's on the web, it's free, right? They just take something and use it. So we want them to understand that when they see this article right from the get-go in the TOC, we're planting that seed that, oh, they need permission for this if they're going to reuse it somehow. Um, and also, if they're out there looking for something or you've got a pharma company or any type of an industry sponsor that you might partner with, they're going to see that as well. Suddenly they know that, Oh yeah, I could get reprints of this, or oh yeah, I could get permissions for this. So we're trying to make it right up, right up front when they're on the site. So when they click on that, they get the pop-up that then walks them through the whole thing of where it says, "I would like to," and then we've got a whole logic tree of how they can use particular content, and then it gives them the automatic pricing and lets them pay for it with a credit card or whatever. Right there, boom, we just we just made a sale. It's nice. Um, and we also have it linked into uh, the, the navigation within the article as well. So if somebody's into the article and they look at the services down the side, that button's kind of small. We're, we're actually redoing our platform, so we'll be um, um, launching with Silverchair. That's, we're going to try to find ways to make that a little bit more prominent. But right now, again, it's at the point of contact. People are on your site. They're in the article. You get them right there. You don't make them search around your site looking for, oh, you know, maybe I'll see this button for permissions way over here. So I'm going to change gears and talk a little bit about mobile. I told you earlier that we have apps. We have an app version of our journal. We have um, these things down here. We have our, our uh, board review app. We have a 3D bronchial tree anatomy app. Um, you know, there's more smartphones on the planet than people right now. Uh, tablets are quickly following that. Mobile data can be anything. It can be images. It can be, you know, video audio, whatever. So you need to think about all those media types when you're creating your international property monetization strategies. Make sure that you're thinking, you know, it's not just about using an image or using an article. You know, you can, you can require permissions for people to use audio clips, video clips, um, all those kind of things. So think about that and the fact that your social media strategy, you're encouraging people to share your content, right? So in other words, the more people that we drive through our Facebook page and our Twitter stuff to articles online, again, the more opportunity we have that people are going to see things like the fact that, oh, there's an image I might want to use or an article that might be useful for me as a professor to give in my course pack that we can get uh, you know, permissions revenue from. Smart smartphones versus Maslow's higher card. I just saw this uh, online, there's basically more people have mobile phone subscriptions than have electricity and drinking water in the world. Is that pathetic or what? And, and, and we all know that too, because everybody's like on their devices all the time. Oh my gosh! Like I forgot to eat today, but I sent 2,000 emails and, and uh, <laughs> updated my Facebook page 20 times. Um, so the, and and this is, this is how we built it into the app. So you know we didn't just do this for the online version, but we we replicated this in the app version, both on our phone and on our iPad app so that when they're on the table of contents they see it as well as when they're within an article on the iPad app there's a button there for get permissions when they want to share it it's got you know email to self email to a friend or get permissions hey you know, um, same thing with the uh, with the iPhone version as well and with, you know when people are using that sharing screen it reminds them that oh yeah I, um, even though you're sharing this with people you still need permission if you're going to use it for uh, other things and and then that kind of prompts them for that I uh, don't want to go over my time too much here but um, 
you know, a little bit about international. I, you know, international is big. I, I'm sure many of you are realizing this. You know, there's the, the proliferation of digital media has uh, obviously your content's being seen by people who never would have seen it 30 years ago. That's just the, the, the way it is, and that's a good thing, but it's important to have definitions of need for permissions. Make sure that you're uh, you know, constantly beefing up your language about usage. You know, embed that stuff in your PDFs. Make sure that, that those things are very clear to people who may be using your content, because a lot of countries will interpret copyright at their convenience. Um, uh, you know, we, and that's, that, that includes the U.S. I'm not trying to be... Um, you know, bashing international. I mean, our U.S. docs probably are the biggest abusers of our content, but by having clear definitions of what people can use and what they can't use for what purpose, uh, that's important, especially as you get into language barriers and things like that. Um, and the other thing is that there, this is an opportunity where partnering with an organization that can help manage your copyrights and permissions helps protect you as well, because you know they're they're there to kind of look out for your content also. Here's an example of what I talked about earlier, our, our global visitors, um, and it doesn't show very well on the screen. There really is a map there that, does, that shows more than the U.S. and, and Alaska. Um, but you know, we get about 1.3 million visitors a year from the USA, but then we get about a million. The top 10 countries, you know, two through 10, add up to about another million. Um, and, and look at the top five. They're, they're all English speaking, right? So those are the areas where we've been targeting things. Um, and, and we also do these international editions in, in China, Italy, Brazil, Spain. Suddenly they've popped up into the top ten of usage. So we're trying to leverage uh, international editions to drive awareness, traffic to our website, all those kind of things. So future fields, you know, to, to, to plant and sow, you know, we're looking at all these things that we do and we're thinking about creating image libraries, image li you know, a lot of people are doing that, but think about that. Images are, are frequently reused by publishers, authors, people all over the place. You know, you, creating image libraries is a nice way to take some of the best stuff you have and then, you know, people are going to see that and want to reuse it. So that's a potential revenue stream. You know, your content's being stored in learning management systems and content management systems and being exposed to more people as we digitize content and put it online and, and put it in mobile apps. Um, you know, video libraries, libraries, audio and synced presentation apps, you know, all these things have potential rights oriented revenue. So I think you know, as you're thinking about you know, what you're doing as an organization, think beyond your, your journal and your publications and all the other content that's out there and how you can start to think, hmm, you know, we should be promoting that and getting paid for it. You know, here's an example. This is we just launched this 3D bronchoscopy app, which has like a 3D thing of the of the bronchial tree, and as you trace down it with your finger on the app, it shows you an image. And we know that people are going to see this stuff and go, "Wow, you know, we'd like to reproduce that image because that's a great teaching point." So, you know, we're going to be working to embed you know permission capabilities into all these things going forward, so that when people see this and want to use it for their presentation at their next meeting and things like that, that they'll they'll come to us for that opportunity. Uh, we're doing you know, all kinds of online things. We did a lung, lung cancer staging site that has all these examples of CT scans and, and tumors in certain areas. Again, these are all things that we need to build you know, rights and licensing around because those are images we know people are going to want to use. So to accomplish all that stuff, I'm you know, preaching to you guys, you got to work with your organizations, break down the silos between those places so that you're, you're, you're working with your education division, your education division is working with you to think about how, how you as an organization can leverage your content to create more revenue. Um, quick summary, any content type has potential to be monetized. Um, you know, digital assets are easily pirated, so it's, it's crucial to have some protection around them. Um, partnering can help you manage the overhead and resources and help protect your content from improper use. Um, it also allows you to diversify your portfolio of revenues. Um, mobile's the future. Um, plan for this. It's more than just apps. You know, you know, the, Everything's mobile now. You know, you can you know, mobile optimized websites. That's what you have to start thinking about as well. It's not just about apps. It's about that your website should be mobily optimized so anybody can go out there and find content and search it. Um, and digital dissemination means your content's global. Take advantage of it by promoting it throughout those different channels and uh, hopefully reap the benefits of, of having some rights and permissions wrapped around that so you can generate some additional revenue. 
And with that, I will close out and uh, see if there's any questions. Yeah, Steve, if you stay there just for a second, I want to thank Steve Welch. He's the Senior Vice President of Communications for ACCP. And great presentation, Steve. And, and I'll start off questioning, if I can, myself by asking about um, a point you made toward the end about uh, not simply making the rights and permissions piece visible in as many ways as you can, but doing some kind of outreach and definition, particularly in the global space. Can you talk more specifically about that and what kind of education generally are you trying to do with your audience around the need to understand copyright? Not enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we, we as an organization, we're doing a lot more than we used to. We're actually, we're actually starting to do uh, international meetings, and we, we're taking that, si that simulation education that I showed you earlier, we're taking that stuff on the road, and we've done several uh, of those courses outside the U.S. in, in countries, and what it's done is it, it's caused a whole population of people who are interested in that kind of education to suddenly become aware of all of our content, including our journal. Even though our journal is pretty well known, when we go out there and do a simulation education exercise, people who aren't members, they're not subscribers, they're not aware of things are, are you know, they're, 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 you know, it's, it's kind of helping to, to push all the, the different brands that we have and the different products that we have. Um, as far as independent outreach, I mean, you know, we're just trying to make it obvious to people that they need to get permissions. I, I, I can see we, we probably need to do more. I think, I think we're not probably doing as much as we could to educate individuals about it. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, maybe you know some strategies well, that other people you're working with are doing that. Uh, well, no, I was curious because I think it's probably as much about listening as it is about telling. I think, uh, you know, as you said, uh, uh, copyright, uh, respect and understanding of it begins at home, but then going out, we understand that there are, you know, national treatments of all, um, there is no such thing as one single international copyright law, there are so many different countries and so many different laws, this makes it a very complicated uh, matter right away, but um, I, as I say, I think the point would be to listen as much as to tell, and I, I don't know if anyone here, I mean, of show of hands around education around rights and permissions. So how obvious, how, how much information do you provide your readers with around these issues? Do, do, would you right. say you, you, you do or don't? I mean, those who think you do, would you raise your hands? So we're seeing a lot of opportunity there, I think, yeah. uh, ar around that subject. Well, one of the things I've done for years is I give a talk at our annual meeting about using technology, like I try to clue our docs into tools that they may not be using um, that would be useful to them on the web because a lot of them, they're so busy taking care of patients that they're, they're not highly, uh, you know, they're not power users of the web. So we found things like I have people coming up to me saying, I don't want any of my colleagues to know this, but I've had this iPhone for a year and a half. I've never downloaded an app. Can you show me how? You know, it's like things like that. They, they don't want to look dumb in front of their peers, um, but they're so busy. That's just not one of those things that they're clued into doing. So, you know, I take it upon myself to, to teach them, here's how, to, you know, here's how to find apps that are useful for you. Um, here's some sites that, that review medical apps. Um, I, I've done talks on social media, and, and one of the things that I constantly hear is, you know, I've always thrown in a little bit about copyright because they all think that if it's on the web, it's free. And, and that happens to us all the time where they, they'll turn in uh, a presentation for our annual meeting and it'll just be <laughs> completely riddled with images that they took from another uh, journal or source or whatever, and they didn't give any, any attribution to it. So, you know, during all of our author, um, um, all of our author instructions for even giving talks or annual meeting, we really clearly say if you use any material from another publication, you need to make sure you have permission. You need to make sure you 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 have a full attribution and cite it uh, properly. I mean, there's just a lot of uh, you know lack of awareness of what they need to do because they just see it go, oh, that's cool, grab it and, and, and put it in their presentation. So. Right. I mean, right, we're asking the question today, where does copyright fit in? And if you don't find a place for it, if you don't make a place for it, it probably doesn't fit in uh, anywhere at all. I don't know if we have some questions from the audience. Do we? If, if you have a question, the best thing, because they are recording this for your members who can't join us today, is to step up to the microphone there in the center of the room and, and if you can't tell us who you are and where you're from. Uh, my name is Mitch Tuckman and I'm from uh, Durham, North Carolina. Uh, I just wondered what are the copyright implications of your permitting people to email uh, articles to themselves and to their friends or are they only emailing links? Yeah, well, you know, what that does is it'll email, um, it'll email the link to the article. They have to sign in to get full access to the article if it's under access control. But you know, like I said, we put our entire archive of content out there, um, and anything that's older than a year is free. So if people find an article that's less than a year old, they can email it to somebody, uh, and, and you know they'll be able to access the full article. Um, you know what we've. 
you know, what we see that doing is really just expanding the, the, the awareness of the content. You know, I'm not so worried about get, about the, you know, 12 or $15 pay-per-view fee that we might get from from that because if somebody sees it and they say, wow, if, if this gets in front of somebody who's writing a book chapter and they say, oh, this has got a great figure um, and we charge, you know, 75 bucks for them to use a figure for that book chapter, that's a win for us. You know, that so I'm seeing that that potential to email content to other people is to me a boon um, because it can lead to other types of revenue sources that are much greater than a little pay-per-view piece that we might get from having access control over that content. And if I can add, it seems to me you know they're doing it and you can track it and get information about it. Sure. They're going to do it anyway. You might as well get that information which is of some value to you. Any other questions from the floor for Steve Welch? Please. Uh, Ted Bokamjian, Society of Exploration Geophysicists. Uh, I was wondering if you could expand on the international editions that you do. Uh, and is, I guess they're in the target languages and um, how you manage the rights around them as well. Sure. We, um, well, with those, uh, with those publications, we work with a local publisher. Um, we select a subset of content. Um, from our, our parent edition, the English language edition, uh, we have it translated and distributed in, in that country. And we really see that as a brand builder and awareness builder. We're not generating huge amounts of revenue from those, um, if, if any at all. In many cases, it's break even, um, which is fine because we're really getting awareness built in, in a population that may not read natively in, in English and things like that. Um, we haven't yet seen a, a a huge amount of revenue from those translated editions yet, but I do think that over time that'll build. Um, we're certainly seeing more traffic coming to our website from outside the U.S. So you went, and like I said, the, you saw that those countries where we had the international editions suddenly were all, almost all in the top ten of, of web traffic to our journal. So we feel like they're having an impact on the English language edition of the website, even though we're distributing a translated edition of those those publications in their country. Um, but the thing that the, the key thing is it's you know it's a small number of articles just to kind of give them a taste of the kind of content we have and what we're hoping to do is either convert them to members, to subscribers, to uh, you know some other type of a customer um, uh, you know, or just finding their websites useful, generating more web traffic. More web traffic means we can sell more advertising impressions. You know, it, and, and I don't mean to talk about that's all about money, but let's face it, at the end of the day, it is all about money, right? Uh. Do you partner with local publishers? We do, yeah. We, uh, we, we usually work with the publisher locally. But we do those. We have, we have members in those countries. We, uh, we put them on an editorial board um, and allow them to like, kind of oversee the process. We have somebody from, you know, who's got loyalty to our organization involved in the project. It's also a nice way to have them get involved. I'm actually talking about Global Tomorrow, so that's a whole different talk. I'm going to touch on that a little bit uh, tomorrow afternoon. But it's, it's kind of a nice way to... to you know, do a couple different things. You get some members involved, but you also get to build some brand awareness of your content and your, and your, your publications, your society. Again, thank you very much, Steve Welch, Senior Vice President of Communications for American College of Chess Physicians. Thank you. Thank you.